So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Angela Brand and I'm with NAMI California and I'd like to welcome you to our town hall event today, um, Imagining a Mental Health System featuring Laura Gregario from Humanest. Uh, before we get started, we're gonna go through just a couple of our housekeeping pieces. So we'll move to the next slide. Um, to let everyone know that today's event is being recorded, so we'll have the materials available, um, including the PowerPoint presentation and a link to the recording um, to share with those who were unable to make it today or who would like a copy of the materials. All of that will be uh, posted to our website um, after the conclusion of the event. We are working today in Zoom webinars, so for those of you that joined and listened to the first five or six minutes of us just chit-chatting before the event started, that's part of our process of kind of working out the technical kinks um, in this different platform. Previously, we had been doing the Zoom meeting, and so transitioning to this webinar platform um, bear with us today as we kind of go through some trial and error. Um, but we do have everyone in listen only mode. The cameras are not on for those who are in participation. Um, you'll see just us here. Um, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, please utilize the chat box uh, that is available to you throughout the event and we will be using it later during our Q&A. Um, if you have questions about the materials, uh, we do have some staff that will be helping to um, share links to things that we discussed today, um, as well as some of the follow up pieces at the conclusion of the event. Um, let's see. And then part of our event today, we're using interactive polling. Uh, we don't use the polling through Zoom. We use a feature called Mentimeter. Your participation is completely voluntary. Everything is anonymous. Uh, the feature that, or the app that we use doesn't require you to download anything onto your computer or your phone. Um, it doesn't have any tracking or third party stuff on it. So um, I think, on, is it on the next slide, the direction? So to participate in the polling feature, um, you can do it on your phone. You can open a separate browser um, in your computer. You go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Um, -E we'll put that into the chat for you as well. Um, let's see. And then you'll see the code here at the top. And so 1628900, that links you to today's polling questions. Um, and again, participation is voluntary. Um, everything is anonymous. We just, we like to be able to kind of get a feel. We'll start with a poll of who's in the room and we'll move through some questions related to today's discussion. Um, if you don't want to use the feature, you can also enter your uh, responses into the chat box as well. Um, and thank you to Ragini, she's entered it into the chat box, menti.com and the code is 1628900. Um, and then to the previous question, we will be sharing the presentation deck um, as well as a recording of today's event um, for everyone afterward. So we'll go to the next slide, which is for us to get a feel for who's in the room. So if you could just enter in the county that you're joining us from, we'll give everyone a couple minutes to put their answers in. The folks in the chat are also answering Amador, Riverside, San Bernardino. Santa Clara, Santa Monica, Tulare, welcome. So it's really great. I see a lot of familiar names, uh, folks who've joined us on a lot of our events um, that we've held over the last nine months. My gosh, I can't believe we have been doing this for almost a year now. Um, but we really just on behalf of all the team at NAMI California, just want to thank everyone for your continued participation and attendance at these events. Um, we've gotten great feedback about how helpful it's been to connect folks at the state and local level on the conversations around mental and behavioral health, um, looking at the different systems and how they intersect so that we can better understand this work and make for better service delivery for ourselves and those that we love. Let's go to the next question, which is how do you identify? Um, check all that apply, parents, caregivers, family members, consumers, um, if you're with one of our affiliates, um, if you represent one of the county behavioral health offices, students, just kind of helps get a feel for our audience and the best way we can do sort of a raise your hand for today. Thank you, everyone. Let 
right. Okay, so we'll move to the next slide. So as we get started, it's really important that we're creating a safe and inclusive space for everyone that's joining. Um, we all have different perspectives, different experiences, and in that vein, we like to say that these are open conversations for folks to be able to share, ask questions without judgment. Um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong experience. Everyone's coming in with varying levels of understanding about our system and how all the pieces fit together. So in that way, we've created these, these um, you'll see on the screen, the community agreements to treat one another with kindness, to listen, speak honestly, to give others space to ask questions and better understand what we're discussing. We do ask that for the things that are shared today, whether it's through the chat box or experiences that are discussed that take away the lessons learned, but the names stay here with us in the room, so to speak, um, and take in the information and know that, you know, with discussion comes the opportunity to expand our knowledge and to change our mind and to better understand the perspective and experiences of others. Um, so with that, we will get started. Um, let's go to the next screen here. Um, so again, it's my honor to introduce our guest today. Lara Gregario is the co-founder and CEO of Humanest. Uh, she has been working in this space, oh, excuse me. She has been working in this space for over 20 years um, in settings ranging from inpatient to community mental health and private practice. She has a commitment to empowering consumers, scaling compassion, and providing care when, how, and where it's needed. Um, innovating designs, I'm sorry, innovating and designing programs in the digital mental health space since 2013. She has built telehealth programs and designed online therapy and mental health community platforms. Um, for those of you joining, you may recognize that she was previously with Seven Cups um, for those uh, that have been in the digital tech suite conversation. Um, her name may seem familiar to you from that. Um, in 2020, she co-founded Humanest to provide an online space to combat loneliness and provide a path to emotional growth and health. And so I would like to go ahead and turn it over to you, Laura, and we'll get started with your presentation. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, it is such an honor uh, to be here today. Nami does such amazing work and it's such a privilege to be able to share this afternoon with everybody who's here. So thank you all for carving this time out to have what I hope will be a really interesting and exciting conversation. Um, as you heard, I am a therapist. That's my background. I've um, founded a company, but I'm also someone who has personally struggled with mental health challenges. Um, I'm a family member of somebody who has struggled with mental health challenges. Um, I work every day to battle my own issues. And so when I say throughout this presentation that we're all in this together, I truly, truly mean that we're all in this together. Um, if you wanna advance the slide, that would be great. Um, as you heard, I have a real passion for thinking about creative solutions to bring care to people where, when, and how they want to receive it. Um, my first, you're probably wondering why there's a picture of an RV here. Um, I wanna give just a little bit of background and context on where, um, you know, where I've come from and where sort of where this conversation is headed um, around thinking creatively outside of the box on um, how we might think about delivering care and, and really um, being really consumer focused and thinking about um, the end receiver of our support systems and how that how we can sort of do a good job, a better job about engaging people in services. So my first job out of grad school was driving a 40 foot RV and I was the driver because I was the newbie on the team. Um, and it was not a nice RV. It was an old like Breaking Bad style um, bounder that could barely make it up hills. Um, and we drove around to homeless encampments um, around Southern and Eastern Alameda County. Um, and my role was as uh, a therapist to do homeless outreach. Um, and I was literally a park bench street curb therapist. And 
the philosophy behind that was that we shouldn't be asking people who are struggling and vulnerable and don't have transportation to come to us where, when, and how it's convenient for us as a provider and as a care system, we should be bringing care to people um, where they're comfortable in a way that's convenient and easily accessible for them. Um, I left that role and I ended up going to community mental health, uh, where I worked in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. And for those of you familiar with San Francisco, you know what a wonderful neighborhood that is. It's a really challenging population that lives there. Um, it's a challenging neighborhood. Um, if you could advance the slide, that'd be great. Um, and when you think about that demographic, I worked in a community mental health clinic where a good percentage, if not almost all of the clients in that clinic were people who struggled with severe chronic mental illness, severe substance abuse issues. Um, and a lot of them wouldn't make it to appointments on a regular basis or maybe ever. Um, and as a system, as a care system, as providers, we would label those individuals treatment resistant, which is really kind of placing the blame on the individual rather than saying, maybe they don't like what we're selling. Maybe don't, they don't like the services or they're not ready for the services that we're offering. And so I began thinking about how do we put ourselves in those shoes? How do we step outside of the box of this sort of medical model of a treatment system and think about how do we meet people where they are in terms of their level of engagement, their motivation, um, their willingness to seek help? Um, I ended up getting a whole bunch of knitting yarn and knitting needle, needles donated um, and starting a knitting circle in the basement of the clinic. Um, and there were a few women who started showing up to our little knitting circle. The only problem I will say is that I didn't actually know how to knit at the time and none of us did. This was pre-YouTube. Um, luckily there was internet and we found a website where um, there were some knitting tutorials online. And so we sat shoulder to shoulder. We watched these videos and week after week together, we learned how to knit. And for the first several weeks, we talked about knitting. And as everybody, they faster than me, got better <laughs> at knitting, we started talking about life. And week over week, we were talking about life issues. And before we knew it, it was group therapy. Um, and after a little while, some of those women started going to their individual sessions. Some of them started back on medications they hadn't been on in a long time. Um, and over time, a new cohort joined our little group and the first group taught the second group how to knit. And then it was a purpose oriented group. Um, they started selling the things they were, they were making at the local farmer's market down in civic center. Um, and it became this really powerful tool of thinking, how do we meet people? How do we think about what are people actually seeking? What are they needing? How do we build trust? How do you build relationship? How do you build alliance? Um, and I think these are all things that we don't think about enough when we think about our care delivery system. And then we wonder why it fails for so many people. Um, I'm gonna spend the next couple of minutes going through some kind of depressing statistics, but I think it's helpful to sort of set the tone and talk a little bit about the problem before we start talking about potential solutions. Um, so if you could advance the slide, I think there's a question next. Um, so I just kind of want to get a sense of, for everybody out there, what percentage of people do you think with mental health challenges get care? If everybody could just do a vote, and I don't know, do we, yeah, we're going to wait here for these to fill in just a little bit. Give another minute or two for the responses. I see some coming in chat too, that's great. Okay, and then maybe if we move on to the next question, I think there's a next question next. And how many sessions of therapy on average do you think people who actually come in attend? Awesome, you guys are good. 
I do some spoiler alerts here? <laughs> All right, we can, I think we can move on. We got good little dose of people answering. So when we look at the total numbers, we're looking at about one out of five people in the US suffer from mental illness. That's about 50 million people. Out of that, only four out of 10 actually get care. So for those of you who said 40%, you were right on. Um, only 40% of people out of that 50 million actually get help. So what's happening? Could you imagine if we said this about cancer or about some other type of physical illness, this would just be completely unacceptable. And yet this is the norm and it hasn't gotten better. Um, if you can advance the slide, please. So let's look at what's happening here. Out of those 50 million people who are struggling, 50 to 75% of people, even when they recognize they have an issue, never make it to their first appointment. From the moment that they're referred to an appointment, 50 to 75% never make it to their first appointment. Of that, of the people who do make it to one appointment, 60% never return for a second appointment. So back to that number, average number of sessions that people attend is one. Actually, the most common number is zero. But of people who do come, the average number of sessions people attend is one session. So what's happening? You would think we could do better than this, right? So let's actually look, let's break this down a little bit and let's think about this care journey. If you could advance the slide, please. And we'll talk through this a little bit. Oh, there we go. So let's talk about this. So one of the biggest hurdles, of course, as I'm sure most of you here recognize, one of the biggest hurdles is recognizing there's a problem, right? So that's that's a huge hurdle to overcome. I mean, mental illnesses are illnesses that tell us we don't have an illness, right? So that's the biggest challenge, of course. And I think it's one of the reasons when you look at people who seek care, there's usually a five to 11 year gap from onset of illness to when people actually get treatment, five to 11 years, which is really upsetting if you think about the fact that we know early intervention and prevention is one of the keys to good prognosis and good outcomes. So that's a long lag time for when people actually get in and get help. But even for those people who do, maybe they decide that they're ready to make a change. Maybe somebody, a family member, decides to help get people into care. So what happens on that first step? You're ready to get care, a family member is helping, you're sort of in that journey of trying to get treatment, trying to get some type of intervention, trying to get some type of relief, right? The first step, most people, you're gonna Google what's out there, maybe you look for county resources, um, then often you're gonna have to play phone tag. This takes a lot of motivation a lot of perseverance and persistence, playing phone tag, reaching out to possible options, seeing what's out there. You've really got to have the motivation to keep pushing through that. Um, this is like huge obstacles. Um, and actually, when you think about the number of steps it takes from the moment of recognition to the moment when somebody gets help, it's something like 27 steps. And a lot of these are really hard. And if you think about that as a sales funnel, you know in sales that we lose about 10% of people on every step. So no wonder, it's amazing anybody makes it through this journey, right? So, okay, so you get through, you make the phone, the, the you play phone tag, you make it through, you finally get an appointment, first available two to six weeks from now. Pretty typical that there's going to be a pretty long lag time from moment of outreach to moment when the first appointment is available. Now, if you think about people who have developed sometimes maladaptive coping skills, if they're wanting relief, the chances of being able to wait to get that relief are pretty low. The likelihood of people are going to get whatever relief by whatever means necessary, much, much greater that that's going to happen, even if we know it's going to be more problematic in the long run. So even if someone makes it in, so they wait their two weeks, um, for those who have not just gone back to maladaptive coping mechanisms and decide that they don't actually wanna to come to that first appointment, that's where we see that 50 to 75% of people from the moment they first reach out, don't make it to that first appointment. Now for the people who do make it to that first appointment, then what happens? They come in, 
Um, maybe they've had to get transportation, take off of work, you know, get childcare. They make it into that first appointment against all the odds. Um, and then they spend that first appointment doing a lengthy intake. They talk about their history. They talk about their childhood. They talk about all the problems. Sometimes they pay some money during that session. Sometimes a lot of money if we're talking out of pocket expenses, sometimes a lot of money. The therapist or the provider or the care system has gotten everything they need out of that session. The consumer often leaves having had no value add. They've gotten nothing they need out of that session. They've unloaded, maybe they've opened up some wounds, but they haven't gotten any value add out of that. This is really problematic. And this is kind of our default journey. This is the default care system journey. And then the next appointment might be two more weeks away. And then we wonder why people don't come back for a second session. Um, because then that's another two weeks of maybe reverting back to old behaviors or really struggling to kind of hold on to get it to that next appointment. So if you advance the slide, it's funny because in, in other fields, we figured this out. I wish I could like see a raise of hands here. If we were in a room, I would ask you to raise your hand. How many of you have bought more than you intended on Amazon? Because, because there was one click buy impulsively, just sort of like, yeah, sure, I'll buy that. One click access. Amazon has this down to a science, right? It's so easy to buy something that people often buy things they don't even need. Or, or maybe want a little bit, but in a moment of motivation, sure, we'll buy that, right? But in our care system, we don't match motivation to intervention, which is just so funny because we do that in other areas. We figured it out everywhere else. But what if we could make mental health as easy as shopping, as easy as online shopping? We can do this with groceries now. We do this with streaming TV. <laughs> Who waits to watch their show when it actually airs anymore? But we haven't done this with mental health yet. And there's a number of reasons why, and if you advance the slide, there's a number of reasons why, right? So if you look at sort of some of these problems, access, engagement, quality. These are the things, I mean, for those of you who are NAMI affiliates, for some of you who are advocates, you know, we've heard these things. These are things that, that are no, this is no surprise. This is no secret. We know these things are problems. Um, maybe you've seen this among your family members or you've struggled yourself. With access, we look at the problem that there's sort of this workforce shortage that happens. We're dependent on a one-to-one -one model. We're dependent on an expert to deliver support often. And this is moving, it's transitioning. I think there's, there is change happening here. There's shift that's starting to happen. But often the, the lowest dose of care, the lowest dose, someone realizes they need help. The very first level of in intervention is once a week, individual therapy, an hour a week indefinitely. And often there's no measurement with that. Again, we're catching up, it's slowly getting there, but, but often there's no, no measurement. So that doesn't scale. If we're gonna be dependent on one-to-one, -one, this is like every time somebody gets a skinned knee, they have to see the surgeon. <laughs> there's gotta be a better way in which we expand that because otherwise we're stuck with wait times. We're stuck with these hurdles that require super high levels of motivation to make it through. And then, we're also dependent on once a week, an hour a week. So if your appointment is at Tuesdays at two o'clock, you only get support Tuesdays at two o'clock. That leaves 167 hours per week where people go without any support. This is just wild, right? And yet this is just commonly accepted. This is just what we do. And now, especially now over the last year where people have become increasingly socially isolated, where they don't have access to, to additional supports. People are even isolated from their families. There's really no support throughout the week. 
And then we go to the problem of engagement, right? So that idea that what happens in that first session, do people not like what they're getting? Are they getting anything of value? I think largely there's, there's often a goal misalignment because we get stuck on thinking about what's the problem, what are the symptoms? And if the, the symptoms are what we're trying to tackle, is that necessarily the same thing from the care system standpoint as it is from a consumer standpoint? What, what does the consumer want by the end of that first session? How do we ask, how do we do a better job of tailoring every single point of interaction to provide value for the consumer so that we can optimize for that engagement so we can ensure people are getting what they want and they need and they're feeling heard, they're feeling this form of alliance and then measuring everything and not measuring things from are we reducing symptoms, but measure, or maybe that in addition to, are we moving the needle? Does the individual feel like they're making progress? What does that perception look like? Because that's very different from saying there's a decrease on a PHQ-9. <laughs> Um, but I think we, we get really, we get really stuck sometimes on these traditional scales and these traditional measures, which have absolute value, but are they sufficient? I don't know. And I think, I think given where we are within the care system, it's beginning, it's beginning to be time that we really break down some of these sort of rigid ways we look at this and we start to actually create care systems that are bottom up that are asking individuals what they want, what they need, are they getting what they need? And how do we do a better job to listen to those and then design accordingly? I'm gonna pause there and I just wanna see how much this resonates. I know on the next slide, I think we have a um, question. So how much does this resonate with your experience, either for yourself, for a loved one, for what you see in your communities in terms of where there's a where there's fall off, where we're losing people with engagement, traction? Yeah. It's sad, right? It seems like we could do a better job. I think it's time. I mean, at this point, especially where we think about um, this crisis that we're facing, you know, last year was a crisis of, of medical need and a lack of resources to meet the medical needs of, of a pandemic. We're facing a tsunami of mental health need. And if we maintain at the level we're going on now, we are not prepared as a society to meet the needs that are coming at us. If you could advance the slide. Thanks. So I am proposing that we really think instead about focusing on strengths rather than deficits. That we focus on solutions rather than on problems that we rely more heavily on communities and on peers and less on experts. I think it's time that we empower people to make informed, and that's often data-informed, measurement-informed decisions about their own care. I think we need to start focusing on motivation and engagement rather than medical interventions, or maybe some blend of both, but one without the other is not sufficient. And I think we need to really start with relationship, forming that alliance, listening <laughs> to needs in a different way than maybe we ever have before. Okay, if you could advance the slide again. Um, the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, Surgeon General said at one point, while loneliness has the potential to kill, connection has even more the potential to heal. I'm gonna say that again, because I think it's like a really, really powerful statement and I have it written down. So excuse me while I read it, but he says, while loneliness has the potential to kill, connection 
has even more potential to heal. I think it's such a powerful testament to how we can be doing a better job as a community to leverage the community, to move beyond this dependence on a one-to-one model. And if we really focus more on leveraging community and peers, there's a ton of evidence to suggest that not doing so is problematic. So low levels of social interaction have been found to have an impact on lifespan equivalent to smoking nearly a pack of cigarettes a day or of being an alcoholic. And it's twice as harmful as being obese. People with depression who perceive social support as poorer have worse outcomes. And I think it's important to to highlight here, perception is key too. So it's not just do they have social support, but do they perceive that they have social support and how What's the quality of that social support? Community support is suspected to be the primary reason that people with schizophrenia in developing countries recover at twice the rate as elsewhere. That's a pretty powerful one. Community support impacts on severe mental illness. Self-help support groups cut re-hospitalization of mental health consumers by 50%. We've seen this with some of NAMI programs in California. Pretty amazing the role that peers can play at, at discharge from hospitalizations and what that can do in terms of recidivism rates. It's incredible. Reducing number of days spent in the hospital by a third. And then I think this really important thing around sense of purpose and the importance of a sense of purpose. There are a lot of really, really great programs that are doing some of this largely internationally. It has, you know, there are quite a few here locally as well, but I think to think about some of the really innovative programs that have, have stepped outside of sort of the traditional model, largely because they're in places where there is not so much of a traditional model. Um, but if you advance the slide. So one of them is, um, some of you may have heard of the Friendship Bench um, and this program, which was started in Zimbabwe, it's moved to five other countries now, I believe. Um, that it's the idea of training up community mental health workers or community health workers. Um, this is equivalent to a peer model here um, or IAPT in the UK, um, but really arming non-professionals with cognitive behavioral therapy techniques and problem solving skills to teach. Um, what they've done in Zimbabwe and some of the other places is that um, individuals will meet one-to-one -one with one of these community mental health workers in under a tree or on a bench, not too far off from sort of that idea that I was driving RVs around and meeting people on park benches. Um, but using peers in that capacity to teach really kind of basic, but also some of the sort of more evidence-based protocols um, around problem-solving skills and CBT. And then there are circles that are developed where, whereby those peers then get together on a regular basis in groups and continue the work, often sharing a task together, whether it's crocheting or something along those lines, like the knitting circles and the tenderloin. Um, so I think that there's also some real, really interesting data that's come out of that, 80% reductions in, in depression quality of life up 60% for participants in this program. Really, really cool data coming out of some of these other places. The men's sheds in Australia was an, is an interesting as well, interesting one as well, where um, women were, were getting together, sort of retired women were getting together to socialize. And a soci sociologist noticed that all the men, their husbands were sitting in the car alone reading a newspaper or something while all the women were inside socializing. And the men needed that connection as well, but they were not interested. So they started a shed where men could go and work next to where the women were all meeting. They could work on wood, wood, you know, working kind of skills. 
And because there was a task and it was task oriented, the men all engaged in that and really started forming relationships over time. But it was, as they say, shoulder to shoulder, as opposed to face to face, because they would talk, but it was while they were working on, an, on a task. That also has been demonstrated to reduce anxiety by 75% and depression by 89%. And, and, and both of these are examples as well as where there's a sense of purpose. There's something people are engaged in together, a shared task that brings people together and, and kind of takes them outside of themselves. I mean, we see this in 12-step programs as well, where people are really focused on the group as a whole, on helping one another, because we know that people who help other people are just as likely to be helped, if not more so than the person receiving help. That scales. That scales way better than the one-to-one -one model. And then there's Stepped Care 2.0 in Canada, um, where they're really focusing on creating an entire suite of tools um, across nine different levels of care. And, and they're focusing on, again, being very consumer focused and looking at the least intensive level of intervention with the most effectiveness and, and stepping outside of level of distress, level of symptom and looking instead at things like motivation as a way to match intervention to, to where the individual is with the idea that they can move up and down within that system, but that might not always be where you start. So again, and I know there's a lot of local, um, really innovative programs as well, um, but I just wanted to bring in some kind of international interesting concepts where people have demonstrated highly effective ways of engaging people, of creating community-based solutions that have really high rates of efficacy and are scalable. Um, okay, if you could advance the slide. So we've teamed up here, um, creating something called Humanest, and I'm just gonna take a second on this, um, but it's really based off of some of these other models, largely based off of Step Care 2.0 in Canada. But again, it's bringing together community, engagement, connection, being consumer focused primarily in a full stepped care solution um, that's really focusing more on motivation and engagement than it is on some of the other sort of medical model problem oriented approaches that have largely dominated a lot of the work. And I, again, I know we're moving away from this, but moving more into embracing a community centered, peer centered workforce um, augmented by clinical interventions and clinicians, um, but not dependent solely on it. Um, okay, one more slide, I think. I want to, as we move into the final phase of this and we open it up for Q&A, I just want to throw out, I threw out my what ifs, but this is really about, like I said, being bottom up, coming from the community and really exploring what are your what ifs. You know, I talked about what if we focus more on solutions than problems? What if we focused on communities and peers rather than individual experts? What if we focused on empowering individuals and motivation and engagement? And I'm curious to hear what what ifs there are here among this group. If anybody else has what ifs, if you could blue sky your concept of a mental health system, what would that include? Safe housing, yes, wraparound services. Are there other what ifs out there that you're thinking, ooh, if we just had the absolute perfect mental health system, what would it include? Eliminating stigma. Integrating family, I see. Recovery. Yeah, I didn't touch on that so much. I meant to, but talking about recovery and well being. 
um, taking a really recovery oriented approach, which I'll say is huge in the stepped care 2.0 model. Oh, no language barriers. I love that. Which again, much easier when you step into a scaled workforce, recreation therapy. Yeah, great ideas here. I'm loving this, loving it. I'm gonna hope that those will keep coming in each day. Yeah, no cultural barriers. Oh, these are so rich. These are so great. I'm hoping we can start to sort of address some of these as we open up our discussion. Um, I was just gonna sort of wrap up by saying that we're really just getting started as we begin to design a new care system. Um, and Humanest is really sort of trying to lead the charge in terms of trying to think about how do we do a better job of listening to communities and incorporating ideas. And we're super early. We you know, just launched this past year um, and we wanna hear from consumers. We wanna hear from systems. We wanna hear from family members. We want to sort of listen to all the voices so that we really are truly building. We can come up with all kinds of assumptions ourselves, but we want to be building for and alongside and with all of you and with the community. Um, so I'm hoping you'll reach out. I'm hoping, and that's actually supposed to have an O, an M at the end of that email address. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping you'll reach out. I'm hoping this is the beginning of what can be an ongoing conversation about how all of us working together can do a better job because it's gonna take all of us. Nobody's gonna be able to do this alone. Yeah, thanks for the updated email in the chat. Um, okay, I that's it for me. I would love to sort of open it up and have an opportunity to, to hear from all of you. All right, thank you so, so much. Um, so for the discussion piece, um, similar to our previous events, uh, we will do the Q&A as moderated through the chat box. Um, if you'd like to propose a question, um, enter the queue just before, sometimes in the conversation that the questions can sometimes get lost. Um, we'll just go through from the top and we'll work our way through. Um, if some of you have multiple questions, we may skip those to ensure that those who are asking a first time question get included. Um, and if we get to the end and we haven't answered all of the questions, we'll do our best to follow up with you after the event. Um, I'm going to scroll here and see if there's anything here. There was a lot of um, information shared in the chat throughout the presentation. Um, answers to the questions and some information here shared by Steve, the mental health app guide. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you to Christine sharing some information about as a professor, I talk about this with my students. Um, information on peer support. All right, so let's get here. So first question we have here is what if we could change people's attitude from me, me, me to us and them? What if we could change from singular inclusionary, it's not about me, but us? I like that a lot. I love that. You know, I think just listening to, you know, the different things that you shared with us and, you know, we talk about this so often, just how personal all of our journeys are and how, you know, sometimes there just isn't a one size fits all and we get caught up in the either or scenario. And, you know, I, I think to an individual on a call I was on not long ago, and she talked about how it's both and, and creating some space for conversation around the idea that you know there's lots of different ways to get where we need to go and we we kind of sometimes get stuck in that sort of either or mentality and so thinking about how it works for each person feels like a lot of work but at the end of the day it's you know i i know the difference between how i access services is different than you know how my sister will access services what it looks like for my daughter is different than what it looks like for you know others and their families and so I think continuing this conversation is really important. 
Um, let's see, there's another comment here. I am on this journey to develop programming to support mental health in the workplace and virtual space. If there are strategic opportunities to be a part of your think tanking circle, please advise. And I think we may be thinking th through doing some of that with NAMI too, where we might have opportunities to continue to discuss um, so that we can all be sort of working together and chipping in and having ongoing conversations. Yeah, that's that's been one of the greatest things about these town halls is we've been able to really bring in folks working in all different spaces. And what we hear a lot of the time is, you know, that disconnect between folks who are just trying to get services for themselves or their loved one. They don't have a lot of time to follow every, you know, possible shift at the state level. And our system in California is complex. And so there's a lot of folks who have sort of this custodial you know, hand in the mental health system. And so you have Department of Healthcare Services and state hospitals and the Oversight and Accountability Commission and everyone plays a different part, but it's not, there really isn't one place to go to really understand like who does what and who do you talk to when you need support in areas. And so I, you know, I'm really grateful to folks like you and the others that have joined us in these town halls, really kind of breaking down the conversation about, you know, how to understand the system, how to access services and supports. And it doesn't always have to be through that one sort of singular avenue. Um, let's see what came in here. How do you, how do you use telehealth to expand from your home geography? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, Genoa Psychiatry may be a good partner for you. Yeah, I can certainly look into that. At this point, we have California licensed therapists, and then we have peer counselors who can really see anybody anywhere. And as we move further and further into the peer space, that also allows us to scale beyond geography. Yeah, the, the next year as they really develop the peer certification piece, I think we're gonna see a lot of expansion and a lot of conversation. Um, I know a lot of our folks are really interested in following that um, and being part of the conversation to ensure that as they move forward, um, state agencies always have the best of intentions, but I, I think they've you know started the conversation by trying to not reinvent the wheel. So let's see, there's two questions that have come up here. The first one is, is there any movement to stop separating by county so that more accessible and coordinated, so that maybe so that more care is accessible and coordinated within the state? I'm not sure, Ruth, if, Maybe I missed a word in that question. We can move on to the next one. How do we support continuity of care once the person is in the system? Hospital step down to residential, intensive outpatient step down to peer support, also vice versa. I love that. I think we do absolutely need more coordinated care. Um, and, and I think people, um, drop off a lot of times between the different levels. And so finding a way to do more warm handoffs, I think are super, super important. I know NAMI's done some of that with peers at discharge from hospitalization makes a huge, huge difference. And I think we can do a much better job at creating a coordinated care system where people are supported with continuity of warm bodies that follow them through that entire care journey. Um, I think that in and of itself could make significant impact. So absolutely, it's something that we're looking at. Actually, we've been work doing a lot of work with um, the UC Berkeley Counseling Center um, as a pilot and talking particularly with their team that does handoff from post-hospitalization and thinking about how do we do that and how do we do a better job of ensuring that that's happening in a, in a more seamless fashion. That's wonderful. Yeah, it, you know, NAMI, we're currently exploring some opportunities to figure out where those gaps are and, and think about how our services and supports can be integrated into some of those systems to provide that warm handoff, to provide that family support. Um, let's see, question, how close are you to peer support certification? Um, I mean, from the state perspective, you know, the law was signed in. Department of Healthcare Services is the agency tasked with putting that process through. Right now, they're kind of in the early stages, and so they're doing some stakeholder listening sessions to um, 
get feedback from families, individuals, consumers, parents about the certification requirements. So looking at some of the work done by SAMHSA and some of the other states around, um, what is it like core competencies and things like that. So I know, I mean, I'm not sure if that, there's a timeline. I know that some folks at the state have said, you know, it's going to be a year. I don't know if you have any, you know, additional information on that. Um, but I know from the work we're doing at the state office that we're following it pretty closely um, to make sure that any opportunity for engagement of uh, families and individuals that were at that table. So, but it's still in, in the early process. Um, let's see. Oh. We have some other questions. See, I'm learning how to use Zoom webinar. Thank you, Ragini. Um, and as I open that, a big, huge thank you to our NAMI California team that work behind the scenes in this, advancing the slides, helping with the technical assistance. Um, they there was from ours to, I see like some questions in the chat. There seems to be a theme around um, county to county borders and barriers and uh, access to care as it changes from one county to another. And yes, I fully agree that that's problematic. I don't, I'm, I don't work with the state, so I can't really speak to that. I can say at least at Humanus, we're, we're, we're people pay out of pocket. We try to keep prices really low um, so more people can access it. Um, but so then there's no barriers. Um, but I know once you get into the county systems, there are a ton of regulations and barriers that make it really, really challenging. Um, okay, so let's hop over to the Q&A. So the first question is, where can I find data on how mental health has impacted specific regions such as LA? And for that, I think, Jennifer, are you asking for like the number of folks just within LA County utilizing services or? And it's an interesting question because uh, some of our folks on our team today had some conversations outside of this event about really being able to narrow down like how many folks you know within California identify as parent consumers and how many family members are in California and really looking at how how and where do we get the numbers so that we can reflect kind of where our populations are situated within just the state's population. Um, you no, know, there's some stuff I think on the MHSA website as well as um, the California Healthcare Foundation. Those might be good sources of information as well. That is great. I'm going to make a note of that. So we'll do some work kind of after this event. Yes, Ragini? Uh, just to another um, resource for that question. Um, you know, when I did the community landscapes, you can also like look up. Uh, the Department of Mental Health in each county, and they usually always have statistics and data per county. Um, it's it's kind of a few clicks and buttons to get there, but yeah, um, that's one. That's a good place to like specifically look into your county. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll. I've got some notes here. So when we after the event today, um, similar to what we've done in the past, we'll do kind of a wrap up from today. We'll share the slides. Uh, we'll provide a link to the recording. And then um, we'll get the links to the Healthcare Foundation website. Um, I know that, like you mentioned, the OEC has their transparency suite where they have some data provided. Um, and then to this, the individual sites that you just mentioned, Ragini, thank you. Um, oh, and thank you to Steve who shared the transparency suite in the chat box. <laughs> um, so let's go to the next question here. How can people with disabilities deal with domestic violence, especially during the pandemic? I think there's a variety of domestic violence resources. So I would I would check out the different domestic violence resources. Um, I think there's probably some good opportunities there as well to connect with other folks who have been through domestic. I think that's a perfect example for peer support, talking to others who have been through it. Can I think be a really empowering situation? It's a tough time right now with people sheltering in place, um, sometimes with really unhealthy situations at home. Yeah, I know we've seen some things come through about rises in rates like that. So we'll do some research around that, Richard, and see if uh, through some of our community partners that there might be some information that we can connect you to. Uh, the next question here is, as a family member, how can I support my loved one who has a mental illness? Families give up because the laws prevent us from getting involved. 
I would love, and I may be speaking out of line here, but I would love to create an online space for families to support one another because it's such a unique experience to be struggling with having a loved one that is struggling with a severe mental illness and to be able to, to talk with others who have been there and are there now, I think, to support one another. I think it's one of those situations where um, if you haven't been there, it's really hard to understand it. Um, so I think I would love to think about how we can work with NAMI to make those available. I know you guys have had the friends and family support groups um, and have those have been an amazing resource and maybe um, expanding that to offering them online. And I think you're already doing them online to some extent as well. Yeah, COVID, COVID kind of pushed everything online for us. And so, you know, we at the state office don't host any direct support groups. Um, we have been exploring some options to be able to do something like that, but our local affiliates who were offering classes and support groups, um, you know, on a really regular basis in person were also impacted by COVID. And so while a lot were able to transition to an online platform, um, some have been a little bit hesitant to do so. There's so many concerns about joining in, you know, an online space to talk about these things. And so, We've been working to, you know, help provide some structure and some um, technical assistance, but a lot of our affiliates really, um, you know, just kind of popped right back up online and have been offering those support groups. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, how do we kind of take that information? How do we use that in this space? Thinking about partnering with you and having additional conversations as it impacts the work that you're doing. But the online space has been really interesting this last year. And so I'm really grateful um, to those affiliates that have been able to continue that service. Um, I know that, you know, we receive a lot of calls at the state office um, for family members looking for support. And, you know, to Sylvia's question, it's, we hear a lot, unfortunately, about how difficult it can be for family members to engage with the system. You know, there's a number of barriers um, that are in place that prohibit the exchange of information. Um, family members that you know, may want to help someone that doesn't doesn't think that they need help. And so there's so many challenges in that space. Um, let's see if a couple more have popped up here. What are some ways that I can motivate my family member to engage with care? I think part of that's around sort of the goal alignment that we had talked about. So like finding out what are what are their specific goals? I know at one point I was having a conversation with somebody who's um, mother was struggling with schizophrenia and um, the therapist was wanting her to, and actually, her, you know, mo most people they didn't engage with was really wanting that her to work on decreasing delusions and hallucinations. Whereas the, the consumer herself actually really loved her voices. They kept her company. Her goal was that she wanted to be able to chop vegetables without being afraid of the knife. And so it's like, well, how do you work on that goal then as an initial point of engagement? Um, and it at least builds that trust to get the ball rolling. Um, and so I think part of it is around goal orientation. I think the other piece of that really is about, again, moment of motivation. How do you capture that window when somebody has slight, a slight bit more insight or is motivated and is willing to do something? And if that's at two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, you've got to do something at two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, or at least have services and interventions available then, as opposed to waiting when their next appointment is. Um, so it really, it's matching intervention and goal to the moment of motivation. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm going back and forth here, making sure the questions in the chat and the questions in the Q&A are here. Um, so there's another here, are peers trained to encourage family members to step up to more intensive care, for example, peer support and wellness centers to psychotherapy? I mean, I think, and I don't know if you have any different um, thoughts on this, Laura, but the I think with peers right now, that's, you know, it's different across the state, how peers are operated, how they're trained, you know, so I, I don't know, I mean, I would, I would say that it's probably likely that some of the training programs have, you know, more comprehensive um, information about the systems, but, you know, I would be hesitant to say yes or no definitively that that's a practice. Um, and then 
there's another question on this side, similar to, so the mental health data impacting specific regions such as LA, especially from the last year. So I think that's similar to our previous conversation. Um, Steve had linked some of the information on the transparency suite um, and Ragini had shared about this individual counties having data available. Um, and so to that question, um, Jennifer, we'll gather that information and we'll send that back out in our follow-up email to you all um, so that you might be able to explore some of those sites to see if that's where um, the information that you want, if that's where it lives. Uh, let's see, question here. Do you find privacy concerns to be a huge obstacle toward creating online support groups? I know for our folks, we did hear, we have heard, um, especially in the beginning as we were transitioning to virtual support groups and classes, there was a lot of concern about privacy. Um, there was a lot of sort of unknown about Zoom and how protected that space was. There was a lot of questions and comments about Zoom bombers. And I know Zoom really stepped up a lot of their security protocols um, as did you know WebEx and GoToWebinar and in those platforms. Um, I think, you know, we heard a lot of comments, not just about, you know, the privacy concerns of folks maybe hacking in, but where folks are engaging from. So, you know, do you have a quiet space that you can connect to, you know, in your home? Um, you know, for folks that, you know, live with a lot of folks, it's, you may not have a, a room that you can close the door. Um, it may be difficult to step away, um, you know, from a loved one. I, I know we did hear a lot of folks were really excited that we were online because they were able to engage with a support group in a class um, when they previously hadn't been able to because they were limited by geography or, um, you know, physical disability and things like that. So, I, you know, I think there's still privacy concerns, um, you know, the internet can be a big, dark, scary place. And if you're not familiar with it, um, you know, I think just it's kind of like easing in. But again, our affiliates have done amazing work in the online space, um, offering classes and support groups, um, you know, just to folks across the state who have needed it. And so a huge, 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 like, like, I don't even know, jazz hands, snaps, like everything to our affiliates that have really like worked hard to bring those conversations to the virtual world. It's it's definitely been, um, it's been an adventure, but they're doing wonderful work um, and it's really helping a lot of folks. And I think there's a cost benefit analysis as well that occurs. I know like somebody has been mentioning Putnam Clubhouse quite a bit in the chat and I know they've seen just an enormous growth in some of their events um, because it's no longer bound by geography. And so people who never would have attended maybe previously are now able to attend. Um, and in a time of social isolation, is that worth, you know, getting online and maybe, you know, risking a little bit of privacy in the interest of having that connection? It probably is as long as, you know, the certain safety protocols are taken into consideration. And, you know, we, we try to be really careful about the least possible information that needs to be gathered is what is gathered in order to get people in and get them the support that they need. Um, and then, of course, just making sure that everything, all the data is stored in really secure places and um, being really transparent about as much of it as we possibly can or all of it about how it's used, where it's used, you know, making that available to people themselves, um, all of it, you know. Yeah, it's, you know, the more we talk about, I, I think we say this in probably every meeting that no one thought that, you know, 11 months later, we would still be broadcasting live from our bedrooms and dining rooms and, you know, everywhere in between. I talked to somebody who had converted a closet into his office. And so it's, you know, I, I think to some degree, this particular model is here to stay in some ways. Um, you know, I can't complain. My dog is at my feet. It's not the worst place for me to be. Although I know that that's not the experience for everyone that, you know, interacting with folks in this digital space is not just difficult for some, but for many impossible. They don't have the resources needed to, you know, connect to folks through these types of platforms. And so I, I think, you know, we've talked a lot in our circles about how this just becomes something that we can add to the menu. So back to that, you know, both and where, we know so many people are really looking forward to getting back to in-person support groups and classes and, and opening the doors to our affiliate offices and community-based organizations and drop-in centers. And, but, you know, having this as something to offer in addition, you know, does help those that this is 
where they're comfortable um, engaging from. You know, for me, it's public speaking in my room is way better than in a room full of a hundred people. And it's, you know, it just, everyone kind of has their own varying level of comfort in the online space. And so I think there's going to be privacy concerns. Um, I think before COVID, it was still, you know, with conversations about the tech suite and, you know, the use of apps and engaging through those platforms. It's not for everybody, but it is for some people. And so, I think the more we can offer a full slate of services and supports, the more likely we are to reach folks, you know, in all corners, however they're, it's, it's meeting people where they're at. It looks different for everyone. I fully agree with you. And I also think that uh, making that as frictionless as possible, because again, people's sense of safety and people's willingness to open up and their willingness to engage and their concerns and fears and anxieties are going to vary not from day to day or week to week, but moment to moment. And so each um, type of interaction is probably going to carry a different level of risk and privacy concerns and safety concerns. And so by making a variety of different ways to interact available at any given moment, people can, it, it doesn't become a barrier anymore. Right. And so we, we allow people, we've seen people come in who we have the option to post questions in our online community anonymously. And sometimes we'll see people post anonymously at first. And then they open up and they're fine with sharing who, you know, their first name or something afterwards because they tiptoed in, <laughs> they did a little bit of like, let me, let me test the waters. And then, oh, I see, I got a lot of support. Okay, I'm fine with saying who my name is. Um, and so I think that there's a little bit of that that happens as well. And that, and it might be that the question they have the next day is one that feels a little scarier again, and they want to go back to being anonymous. That's totally fine. You know, and so I think it's, it's the being able to be flexible from our end, because people's experiences are flexible and changing, ever changing. And mm -hmm. so should our interventions be. Absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, as, as an aside, thank you so much. Steve has been posting links to resources and answering the questions <laughs> as we go. So I just want to say thank you so much, Steve. There's um, He's been sharing some information on some peer certification pieces. Um, I want to make sure we don't skip any of the questions. There's one here. How can I access this webinar to share with my NAMI board? Uh, we'll have a link to this um, event as well as the materials um, after we close out today. Um, we'll gather everything and this will be included in our follow-up email. So if you're registered today, you'll get a copy of it. And please, you can share freely with your networks, your affiliate folks, your members, um, your next door neighbor, whoever you think might really benefit from this information. Um, so I'm gonna make sure there's some questions in the Q&A here. Coming over to this side. Let's see. Um, have you found with the humanist community any concerns from individuals who are hesitant to engage online, um, i.e. Mis mistrustful of technology? How do you address that? I think we have touched on that a little bit, but um, definitely want to give you some space to answer that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's kind of what I just said is that we do have varying different levels. We have some free drop-in groups as well, and often we'll see people who kind of dip their toe in the water that way. Um, by sort of testing that out and they're held on Zoom and people will come in with no video on, they might not speak the first time and then the next time they do. And same thing within our community um, in the message boards where people, you'll see people literally change their, the way that they're um, interacting based on, you know, what their need is in any given moment and their comfort level. So yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you. Um, let's see, follow up for peer certification. If they have never had the experience of having access to a best practice provided by a therapist, how can they lead a person to that quality of care? We have more and more evidence about the effectiveness of the therapy in addition to meds and treating SMI, but how many peers have accessed this type of care? How can they tell my loved one about it and provide inspirational success stories if they haven't experienced it? That's, that's a great question. I think that's, you know, we, like we said before, we all come in with different experiences and different levels of engagement and, and knowledge about the system. And I, you know, our our particular NAMI California uh, works with NAMI San Diego as part of our family and peer support specialist training program. And 
it's a pretty comprehensive model. Um, Ragani, who's joining us today, um, works on that project. And so they go through, you know, modules. There's 17, I believe, and it's it's pretty comprehensive um, preparing folks to work in this space. But, you know, to this comment, I think, you know, we bring our experience with us and depending on our experience, there may be things that, you know, we don't know to share, um, you know, or avenues that we don't know to um, explore. And so I, I, my engagement so far with folks working in the peer space, either employing peers or working as peers is a lot of settings where, you know, they work together in groups and they, they talk about their experiences and they share, you know, who they're working with and for. And so there is some, you know, group work that's done to kind of help brainstorm and, you know, think about how to best connect folks to services. And so I don't know that it's like that everywhere, but I know that it's like that in some spaces. So the hope is that, you know, even if, if I were to be working with someone and I don't have, you know, access to all those areas that, you know, the team I work with can, you know, bring those experiences to me as suggestions. So that does happen. And, um, you know, but I think it's hard to tell if it happens everywhere. <laughs> A lot I like. I think that goes back to the idea that none of them should be an exclusion. I mean, I think there's a time and a place for every type of intervention and every type of provider, right? And so I think being able to have all of them available mm -hmm. is incredibly valuable and, and all of them available, not only, you know, all of them available at all times, you know? So it's not just like this month, you're only meeting with a peer and next month, you're only meeting with a therapist, but really from any moment, there may be um, a point at which, and it's, and, and if you think about it, like somebody who's in substance abuse treatment, but also goes to AA, they may see a therapist for part of that. And then they also have peer support on the side. And that might happen in the same day sometimes. And it should often happen in the same day. So this is like the, the approach in the model is not necessarily something new. Um, it's just not something we've used as a generalized approach. So I'm going to scroll here, make sure I haven't left anything out. Um, let's see. All right. I think that's it on the question side. Let me check the chat box. So a lot of folks sharing information and, and I'll take all the information shared in the chat box as well um, and include that in our follow-up email. There's some good information about different programs and some opportunities for folks that want to engage further. Um, so do we have any other final questions or let's see. Let's pop up our closing slides, Ragini. We can wait if folks have any questions that come up through that. Um, but in the meantime, let's see. So we do have um, an event evaluation. I would just like to know kind of your thoughts on today. Um, and if you wanna continue in the conversation, if you have any questions that kind of pop up after the fact, you can always reach out to me. Um, my email address is here on the, um, the slide. I'll pop it into the chat. Um, I can be, there we go. So my email address is in the chat if you have any follow-up questions. Um, Steve, you have a question here about the peer pilot. Um, I'm not sure what I'm not sure what that's in reference to. If you want to clarify that, um, I can try to provide some more information. Or if the question is for Laura, I'm not sure. So, um, so let's go to the next slide. So our event evaluation is here. Um, my email address is there. If you wanted to follow up with me on anything. There we go. And the event evaluation link is also there. Thank you, Ragini. Um, we have some information here. If you want to share your thoughts with us, we um, conduct 30 second surveys. So just quickly trying to grab some thoughts and uh, feedback from you all. So this one here is since the pandemic started, what have been the pros and cons in terms of accessing behavioral health care? Um, you can access that survey link. I'll pop that in the chat for you also. Um, is that so we'll get that in the chat and then we also have other surveys too if you would like to take those um, then let's go to the next slide here
Thank you, Ragini. Um, and then for those of you that um, aren't already signed up for our email newsletter, um, you can do so through the link here. This will give you information on any upcoming events and activities, including our upcoming town hall, which we are working on securing our speakers for now. So I don't have the date yet, um, but if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get information on that, advocacy alerts, um, upcoming things to participate in, our 30 second surveys, um, all that fun stuff. So that's there in the chat. And then last but not least, um, we've got our Save the Date, our NAMI California Capital Advocacy Day will be held March, or March, May 4th. <laughs> um, and our youth symposium is coming up as well. So this is a two day event that'll be focused on discussing student mental health um, and sort of the state of youth mental health um, in California. So that's a two day event coming up on April 13th and 14th. We'll have registration information um, and dates for you all um, very shortly. So mark your calendars for that. Um, so thank you to everyone who has submitted questions, um, who was engaging with us. Again, thank you to Steve. You shared tons of information with folks today. Um, that was really wonderful to have that help. <laughs> um, but most importantly, thank you so much to you, Laura, for joining us, um, sharing information about what you and your team are doing. Um, really just building out that supportive system of care in our state, um, bringing resources to folks where they're at. Um, so thank you so much for all the work that you and your team are doing. Thank you to our team for behind the scenes, your support, um, helping with all the hiccups. We'll work out the Zoom webinar kinks so that next time <laughs> You don't have to listen to us have a conversation before the event starts. <laughs> um, but again, just, you know, thank you for taking some time out of your day to join us. Um, we really hope that these, inform um, these events provide, you know, resources and information that helps you um, in your own journey and that um, for your loved one. And so with that, I just hope that everyone has a wonderful day. Stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Bye.